Kensington Building in downtown Winnipeg, home of the Regional Indian Affairs Office. For Indians, a symbol of power and authority. Power and authority that is questioned by Louis Stevenson, chief of the Pegwas Band. And I guess it's a pretty sad state in Canada. Stevenson has brought his demonstrators here often to protest conditions on his reserve. You know, this is, this is outright racism. And earlier this year, the eyes of the world turned to Manitoba's inner lake when he invited the South African ambassador to tour his reserve. It was a public relations coup. How delighted I am to meet you here. All this earned Louis Stevenson and the Pegos Band a reputation for impatience and anger. But their anger isn't new. It has brewed and simmered for decades. And its beginnings can be found in another time and another place. Manitoba is all Pegwas Band's story begins here, in what the Cree Indians call Death River. More than two centuries ago, smallpox swept through the families that camped on its banks, killing most of the people. These days we call this area Netley Creek. It's at the mouth of the Red River. In the late 1700s, a Soto Band, led by a chief called Pegwas, arrived here from an area we now call Ontario. They were looking for abundant wildlife and they found it here, along with abandoned Cree encampments. Pegwis and his people made the creek and the Red River their home, but their life soon changed forever. With the blessing of the Hudson's Bay Company, in 1811, Lord Selkirk sent a group of Scottish settlers to the Red River. Pegwis welcomed them and became a steady friend of the settlers. He fed them when they were starving, and he supported them when the Hudson's Bay Company fought with the rival Northwest Company over the fur trade. And finally, in 1817, he signed his mark to a treaty which gave Selkirk access to thousands of acres along the Red and Assiniboine Rivers. Without Pegwis' support, the fortune of Selkirk's Red River settlement would have been very different. But in just a few decades, the tables would be turned, and Pegwis' people would not get the same treatment. After Pegwis died, his son Henry Prince became chief and took over the job of protecting the band's interests. White settlers were increasingly hungry for land. So in 1871, to preserve some land for his people, Prince signed another treaty. It created the St. Peter's Reserve, rich and valuable agricultural land on both sides of the Red River, stretching from the town of Selkirk, 12 miles north to the Netley Marsh. Despite the treaty, the conflict over the land continued. What followed was 30 years of total confusion confusion over the status of reserved land already owned by the Indians, confusion over whether they had the right to own and sell that land, and confusion over the rights of non-Indians who owned land on the reserve. Six separate investigations and a court case couldn't settle the matter. Finally, in 1906, Manitoba's Chief Justice, Hector Howell, became a one-man royal commission. His job was to find a resolution to the confusion and conflict over the reserve even if it meant getting the Indians to surrender their land. I made up my mind that for the good of the Indian tribe, beyond any question, they ought to get off that reserve. And as for the neighborhood, it would be a vast advantage. I felt the Indian reserve there was a black spot. The white community at Selkirk and Indian Affairs officials supported Howell's conclusion. They wanted the land to go to the white farmers, and they thought the Indian should be moved away from the temptations of liquor. But at three separate meetings in 1907, the band almost unanimously rejected the idea of giving up their reserve. This 600-page tar report prepared for the Pegwas band tells what happened next. It says Howell and Indian Affairs officials met with the chief and council September 1907. They were paid $5 to attend the meeting and told they would get more land and money than the other Indians if they supported plans to surrender the St. Peter's Reserve. The Indian leaders agreed. 
Two days later, a meeting was held in a log building on the reserve. Only half of the 200 people who showed up could fit inside the building. The rest stood at the windows and tried to hear the meeting, which was conducted in English, a language many of them couldn't understand. The officials made their pitch, but most of the people were still strongly against a surrender. Sam Fable was just a boy in 1907, but all his life he listened to the stories about the surrender. Stories about a boat that pulled up to the riverbank the first night of the meeting, and the Indians that went aboard. All he says when he got in the boat, this man wanted to make the surrender with the Indians. He says, open that door there, he says, get that stuff out of there. So he, he says he opened the door. Looked in there, he says, there were three, three gallons of whiskey in, the, in there. Okay, he says, give these fellas a drink. Then he says, you'll give them a drink around. It wasn't very long, and another, another drink, eh? Maybe four or five drinks, what? The tar report also supports the evidence of bribery, because by the next day, many Indians had changed their minds and decided to support the surrender. Finally, the Indian Affairs officials announced that there would be a vote, but it was unlike the careful elections that the Indian people were used to. They were all herded outside and divided into two groups, all those for the surrender and all those against. And at the last moment, just before the vote was taken, the Indian agent, Reverend John Simmons, pointed to the group that was for the surrender and shouted, all those who want $90, let him stand over there. Former Chief William Asham would testify later that the Indians were shoved around like cattle. There was quite a general confusion there for a while. There were people going backward, forward. They didn't know where to go. For many years after, questions would be asked about how the vote was taken. It was very close. 107 for the surrender, 98 against. Almost immediately, a surrender agreement was produced and signed by the Indian leaders and the St. Peter's Reserve was no more. The agreement said band members would be paid for the sale of their reserve land, and they would be given a new reserve, 75,000 remote acres on the Fisher River. Not everyone moved there, but in the next few years, many would leave the cultivated land they were used to. They would make the long 100-mile trek north to the new reserve, and among them was a small boy named Sam Favel. To bring me away from St. Peter's to a place like this, boy, that was poison. Coming away from a good country to come to the wilderness. The reserve was uninhabited wilderness, a mass of dense forest where man can hardly walk, and it was filled with mosquito plague swamps. It took years to clear and cultivate this backbreaking country. Years that Sam Fable remembers well. There was no houses here. This was just bush across here. And across there, just muskeg. Floating bog almost. It was, it was miserable. Meanwhile, the old St. Peter's Reserve land was auctioned to speculators at fire sale prices. And according to the tar report, Unscrupulous businessmen used liquor and trickery to buy former reserve land that had been given to individual Indians. By 1911, the Indians had hopes of getting their reserve back. The Manitoba government appointed a royal commission to look into a growing political controversy over the St. Peter's surrender. The majority report of the commission found that there was not enough notice of the surrender meeting, the hall was too small, the conditions of the surrender were not explained, and the final vote was not a proper one. Justice Prudhomme helped pen the commission's final report. We are of the opinion that the surrender was not only voidable, but void, could not be ratified, and was not ratified. But the people who had snapped up the rich reserve land put pressure on the federal government, and the commission's majority report was ignored. In 1916, Parliament passed the St. Peter's Act, which legalized the land buyer's land titles, and dashed the Indians' hopes of ever getting their reserve back. Eighty years have passed since the St. Peter surrendered. The wilderness around the Fisher River has been cleared, and 3,000 people live on the Pegasus Reserve. The people here have shown they're not afraid to go to the Indian Affairs offices in Winnipeg to 
demand more jobs and better housing and education for their children. And beneath this surface, the anger over the St. Peter surrender is kept alive. People like Chief Louis Stevenson want that score settled. In order to do that, Indian Affairs officials say the chief can go to court and he can submit the tar report or any other evidence he may have in a claim for compensation. Stevenson says in the months to come, he'll do just that. I won't rest until, uh, until this thing is resolved and our people are, are, are uh, adequately compensated for what has happened in the past. You don't correct a, a wrong by passing an act of parliament like they've done in 1916. You know, the St. Peter's Act doesn't change the fact that our people were, were uh, uh, you know, cheated out of their land. But the evidence in the Tar Report is just one version of the facts. A whole host of legal arguments can be made against the band's claims. And a lot of people say that this generation should not be responsible for the sins of its forefathers, that too much time has passed since the surrender. And besides, the land is now owned by others. It's lost forever. But the people of Peguis refuse to forget. Sam Fable says those who have power today must fight for the rights of those who once had none. It's not like today, my friend. Today, an Indian is stands equal to a white man. An Indian can talk to any white man. Doesn't matter what kind of English he talks, he can still talk to him. Whether he's a pure Indian or what, he can still talk to a white man. We couldn't do that long ago. For 24 hours, I'm Jim Compton.